Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American Spy Fox. Welcome to the channel where today we will be taking off with the whole series, something that we started a long time ago. Many other videos have been made about Courtney Love's life, but again, the whole series will be a timeline and I discovered that there were some years of Courtney Love's life that she doesn't like to talk about. I re-watched Courtney Love Behind the Music where they recount her entire life and I noticed something. From the years 1985, 1986, 1987, 1988, they just skip over those years. Typically, you would just think, well, nothing eventful happened during those years, so VH1 or Spen or whoever created that documentary did not feel the need to talk about it. Nothing cool happened. Using other media sources, and most importantly, an interview with Cap Jelen, we will be able to fill in that hole within her life as to make a complete timeline. And what I discovered, I would describe as Courtney Love's second major con. If you're interested in knowing what her first big con was, we talk about that in the video popping up there, Courtney Love's first big con. This one involves Cap Jelen and Jennifer Finch and Eric Erlinson, so we are going to stick it in the whole series. Before we get started, a couple things you need to know. According to the Courtney Love Behind the Music, she was legally emancipated in 1980. Courtney Love was born in 1964. This would make her 16 years old. According to her father, Hank Harrison, and yes, I did find out Hank did pass away peacefully in his sleep, uh, rest in peace, Hank Harrison. He was an eccentric guy. He lived life the way he wanted to live it under his own terms. And I'm really regretful that I didn't have more time to get more information out of him and get him on the channel. The thing I liked about Hank is he lived his life the way he wanted to live it under his own terms. And you talk about a guy who really didn't give a crap what people thought about him. I mean, he was the real deal. He really did not care what people thought about him, but it's just the way things went. And um, I'm grateful for the times he did talk to me and for sending me his book. According to Hank Harrison, Courtney did not legally become emancipated until the following year, 1981, when she was 17 years old, and it wasn't a legal emancipation. Hank told me that he sprung Courtney out of a juvenile group home, detention center, whatever you want to call it, when she was 14, and she actually lived with him in Ireland for three years, from 14 to 17. But as we all know, Courtney did not like her father. I, I see that you have a uh, thing for flowers. I guess the psychedelic era. Were any of you around then? or My parents were hippies and I hate them. He was too real for her. He destroyed the image she created and she couldn't have that. So she never talked about her father or the time she spent with him, but she did live under his care for three years. Courtney wanted out from under his wing. She did get what she wanted, but she went about it in a totally illegal way. And again, that's what we talk about in this video. Through an illegal process with fraudulent documents, Courtney gained control of her trust fund that her grandparents had left for her in 1981, and she takes off from Ireland to the States. At some point in 1982, she makes friends with Roddy Bottom from Faith No More. She did spend four months as their lead singer, and I even found an old interview with Courtney, with Faith No More, as their lead singer. A couple interesting points I want to make using this interview just real quick. First, the interviewer asks, what's up with your name? Why is it constantly changing? What does it mean? And they sort of avoid the question, but they end up saying this. We're constantly changing. And we're Faith No, no Money. Not... This week we're Faith No Money. Some of us are together, yeah, right? but certain members of the band haven't quite got together. Mm. Yeah, this line up right here, maybe two months. We're faith no cryptic. No, two months? Yes, yeah, it's just constantly evolving. All right, so next time we see you, it might not be the same. Yeah, just I wouldn't like, count just like every so Just like the Grateful Dead. Just like life. Just, just like, like, just like the Grateful songs. Dead. It's all different. They say this lineup right here that you see, we've only been this band for about two months, and the next time you see us, 
you can bet it's going to be different and they say just like the grateful dead the grateful dead was a band that members quit new members came in you know i believe it was roddy that said we are constantly evolving my biggest point is hank harrison Courtney's father, as you probably know, was the very first manager of the first lineup of The Grateful Dead. Did you see how when Courtney said, just like The Grateful Dead, she turns her head away? Just like The Grateful Dead. Songs. It's all different. It's almost right then she's realizing they're going to get rid of me. They may have let me in the band because they thought it was cool that my dad was the Grateful Dead's first manager, but they just said, the next time you see us, I bet the lineup will be different. I think Courtney realized right then she was going to be canned. I almost feel sorry for her. I just thought of something. Why don't we uh, introduce everyone so we won't be so anonymous? I'm Roddy. <laughs> I'm Mike Cougar Mellon. I'm Bill. I'm Mark. I'm, I'm Courtney. She's not really Courtney, though. No, sometimes she's Courtney. I know, she'll be someone else Courtney. in two months. In case you didn't catch that, Roddy said, she's not really Courtney, she'll be somebody else in two months. Even as early as 1982, Roddy Bottom could see right through Courtney, right to Courtney the Chameleon, the girl who will be whatever you want her to be as long as it makes her famous. Years later, although in Courtney Love Behind the Music, Roddy Bottom would say she sort of weaseled her way in the band. It was the summer I was 18. I saw Faith No More playing with Gun Club and I had a wedding gown on and I looked cool and I knew it. She just talked her way basically into the band. Courtney said, what's sign? I don't think Roddy was stupid. I think he knew what she was doing and he found it funny. He, he found it brazen. He thought, you know what? I kind of like it that this girl is so manipulative and I'd rather have her as an ally than as an enemy. That's the feeling I get from Roddy Bottom. For whatever reason, Roddy says it's because they wanted more of a male energy, and it was at that time a very male-dominated world, they let Courtney go. And Courtney just kind of floats in between San Francisco and Los Angeles from 1982 to 1984. This is the period of time that she meets Jennifer Finch. And they're just sort of floating around. They don't really have a clear path. They don't have a future in mind. They're just young and having fun. This is also the period of time that Courtney first begins abusing heroin. There was this huge amount of peer pressure to do heroin, huge. She wanted to try it. Notice that she says there was so much peer pressure and you weren't cool if you didn't do it. But then her friend Jennifer says, well, she wanted to try it, so I gave it to her. Over and over again, we see these contradictions. Courtney says one thing, her friends say the opposite. Courtney blames them, they blame Courtney. Take note that in between 82 and 84, so from the age of 18 to 20, Courtney begins abusing drugs, including heroin. This is many years before Kurt Cobain would say that he himself tried opiates. This is where things get interesting. 1984 through 1985, Kat Bjelen is hanging around the Satyricon Club in Portland, Oregon, and she's making a name for herself. Yeah, and I kind of knew how to play guitar. I'd been in three bands before on the West Coast, like the Venerais, Italian Hornons, and some other various bands. At this period of time, around these clubs up and down the West Coast, it is a male-dominated world. When a female comes along who can hold her own with all these men, she gains a lot of notoriety. Word gets out quickly. Cap Jelen is gaining a reputation for being this badass vocalist guitarist. In mid-1984, Courtney returned to Portland looking for a fresh start. It wasn't long before she heard about a new girl in town, a girl in a band. Courtney Love seeks Cap Jelen out. Again, in Behind the Music, they sort of play it off like it was destiny. They just sort of cross paths. But listen to Cap Jelen's words. She says, And she said, Oh, I want to meet you. You have to be in a band with me and just everything, spilling everything out at once. She told me she wanted to meet me. Back then, no email, no social media, no way to really promote yourself. A lot of people who became famous took the initiative to just find out who was who, call them, and convince them, I'm your guy, I'm your girl. I need to have this role, you should pick me. And Courtney was a master at charming people into believing that she had more talent than she actually possessed. Just like Buzz Osborne, Courtney was always networking and she was always paying 
attention to the up-and-comers. She was always picking and choosing who her friends were based on their talent. And right away, she wins Cap Jowan's trust and her friendship. I met Courtney at the Satyricon Club in Portland, Oregon, and I liked her. She was really vivacious. Cat immediately discovers upon their first band practice that Courtney actually doesn't play any instruments and really doesn't know what she's doing. She did not play an instrument at the time. <laughs> I mean, she kind of did if you count like playing keyboards, like ding, 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 playing. She tried to strum. I mean, she could hear it in her head, but she couldn't play it. So she'd hum it to me and I'd transpose it. But she likes Courtney so much that she figures that's okay. I'll teach her. She can follow my lead. And she also has Courtney hum the melodies within her head so then she can actually put it to guitar, turn it into music. So at the beginning of this union, Kat is in control and Courtney is pretending to be a beta female, but we all know that can't last for long. She convinces Kat that she believes there's going to be a music explosion in San Francisco. She convinces Kat to move with her. At one point she just goes, we have to go to San Francisco. I know there's gonna be, like she had this feeling a big music explosion is either going to be in San Francisco or Seattle. If you are also a thrash metal fan like me, you would know that Courtney was right. This is Metallica Kill em All season in the San Francisco Bay. Wrong genre of music for Kat and Courtney. Moving into 1985, come June 1985 is when Courtney and Kat pack up and they moved to San Francisco. Now, why does Courtney always go back to San Francisco? If you listen to her story, wherever she goes in the world, she always comes back to San Francisco. Well, I read a newspaper article from the year Courtney's father was taken to court. He supposedly gave her LSD when she was around two or three years old. It was never proven. He vehemently denied it to me and said he would never do that to any child. He told me that the Reese family made this up, used it against him in court, to wrestle any kind of child visitation or custody from him. They saw their daughter as a debutante, and Hank was a dirty beatnik that hung around hippies. Makes complete sense. I actually believe Hank. Courtney's family had a very well-known name. At the time she was born, in one of the old newspaper articles I read, it said her grandparents were friends with the mayor of San Francisco. So they had a lot of connections and they could have easily wrestled any kind of visitation or custody away from him. All they needed was an excuse to do so. Hank himself told me that he didn't do much LSD himself and he would often talk people down from trips. In the late 60s, early 70s, all the runaways and the hippies and people running from the Vietnam War, they all just seemed to sort of congregate in the Haight Ashbury area of San Francisco and free clinics were set up and there were you know spiritual leaders and life coaches and everybody had a job and it was just like this big collective they all wanted to help each other and sort of live together freely Charles Manson was known to take the girls from the desert ranch into the free clinics in Haight Ashbury to have them cured of STDs or abortions or, or whatever they needed there were people there to help even if they weren't necessarily licensed or conducting a legally recognized clinic. Somehow, Hank obtained the position and the notoriety that if you're having a bad acid trip, you go to him, you call him. He's somewhat of a medic for bad LSD trips. A New York Times article at the time even recognized Hank Harrison as the guy to call if you're having a bad trip. The Reese family spun this around. W what was a good thing that he was doing, they spun it around and made him out to be this evil guy who gives everybody LSD in their drinks. When in fact, as I said, he told me he didn't even do it that much and he just wanted to help people with their experience to ensure that they didn't suffer any trauma from what they were going through. Courtney Love's grandparents' name, the Reese family, to this day, their name still holds a lot of weight in that town. Courtney sees San Francisco as home, its home base, its safety, its security. And Kat will go on to talk about this apartment they lived in, or rather I believe she calls it a flat, that they could roller skate in. Me and Courtney lived in this house that I found in the paper. It was on Fillmore and Oak. It's just a really big flat, empty, like you could roller skate in there. And like we dumpster dive and 
put dead flower, semi dead flowers in our apartment. Don't be confused by that statement. Don't get it twisted. When she says they were dumpster diving, it wasn't because they were living a poor life. How many of you live in California? How many of you live in a big city? How much would an apartment big enough to roller skate in in San Francisco cost? even back then. Which brings me to another point. In the E! Entertainment documentary that we're seeing clips of right now, Courtney Love's biographer says that her trust fund granted her $800 a month. And Courtney Love behind the music, Courtney says she only got $500 a month. Her father told me she got $2,800 a month. And he would know because he's the one who sprung her out of the group home and took care of her from 14 to 17. Now, I know different documentaries say she was doing this, she was doing that. These were short little trips she took. Hank proved to me that he did, in fact, take care of Courtney for three years. And he's the one who found out about her trust fund. And it was actually coming to him for him to take care of her a big part of the reason he was affording to live in Dublin, Ireland. Of course, Courtney didn't want her dad to get her money. She wanted to get it directly. We talk about that in another video. My point is this, and it was kind of weird to talk to a man about his own daughter stripping, but you know, we got into the subject and he said, I don't believe Courtney ever stripped because she didn't have money. Sure, she had a drug habit, and as even Roddy Bottom said, she would get money every month and just blow it in a huge way. But Hank said there was no reason for her to strip. He believed, and I believe, that she did it for the attention. Courtney Love had such a great need, this huge hole that needed filled with attention. And if she couldn't be famous, then she would at least get attention by stripping. I don't believe Courtney Love ever stripped to support herself. Her family would support her. Even if they didn't want her, they would still throw loads of cash at her. She did it for the attention. That is how terribly she yearned for fame. She would take attention even from an old, fat, drunk trucker. You know how you dream and plot and dream and plot, but the weird thing is, is I had songs and she had ideas. So that was a good, like, you know, team, but I don't know. There's not much to say, really. I like playing music, and she likes being famous. Kat follows Courtney back to her hometown of San Francisco, where Courtney invites Jennifer Finch from Los Angeles, her old running partner, up to San Francisco, where the three of them develop the concept of a band. It would be called Sugar Babylon. Eventually, it would turn into Sugar Baby Doll. But it wasn't really a band, even as Kat says herself. <laughs> She would say, um, let's put a little of this, you know, speed. Let's just put a little in our tea. It won't hurt anything, you know, in our tea, like ladies, and have a little. It'll help us write our songs or get inspired. And that's how that started happening. It was almost like I did it so many times until I became addicted. It's like I forced myself to become addicted, and that created a problem. Wait a second. So you're telling me if you do drugs a bunch, then you'll become addicted? Is that how that works? She ended up needing to go get high before we would practice. Every time she'd do it, she'd take, take all her clothes off, walk in circles, talk about stuff, not play music. It really didn't have any music. Kat says even Jennifer at this time couldn't play anything. It was more like a concept. We took lots of pictures. We were just like having fun with like, it was like pretend sort of. It was more of a concept. It was pretend. Kat says, at the time, of course we know different now, but at the time, Jennifer Finch couldn't play a note either. Still, Kat was willing to work with both of them. She was willing to teach both of them how to be musicians. But she says that every time we'd go to practice, Courtney would just do speed and end up with all of her clothes off, walking around in circles, talking to herself. Eventually, she got fed up with it. However, she is Courtney's friend, and she doesn't want to hurt Courtney's feelings. And I believe there may have even been a little fear there that even at that point in time, Kat knew double-crossing Courtney probably wasn't a good thing to do. Fortunately for Kat, she catches a break. She decides to sneak away while Courtney is down in LA. So I moved to Minneapolis because I heard like Soul Asylum and Who's Could Do and the replacements were from there and lots of garage stuff. So I split when she was trying out for Sue Nancy. I just kind of took off sneakily. I just didn't want to play with her anymore. It was too high drama. And so I just wanted to go play garage music and she wanted to be more pop. Yes. And in her own words, she says, I sneakily left. 
This is how worried Kat was about how Courtney would react to someone leaving her. When I hear Kat say this, it makes me think about Kurt and how he wanted a divorce and how his life suddenly ended. Another point I would like to make is Kat says, I wanted to play garage music. Courtney wanted to be pop. Courtney always wanted to be like a Stevie Nicks. She wanted to be mainstream. That was her goal from the beginning. Even in her advertisement, which we'll get to, where she recruits Eric Erlinson, her first influence, Fleetwood Mac. She ends up covering a Fleetwood Mac song, and I have to admit, she did a pretty good job with Gold Dust Woman. I will admit that. Cap Jellin, in another interview, talks about how she wanted to take Courtney into a black flag show, and Courtney's response was, I'm not going in there with those dirty punk rock boys. This is why it bothers me so much, and it will always bother me. It will always get under my skin and I know it gets under your skin too, that people call her the queen of grunge, the queen of post-punk. Courtney was mainstream. She always wanted to be mainstream. Grunge took over at the same time Courtney had a band and met Kurt Cobain and all these opportunities arose. So that's what she did. That's what she had to do to become famous. Just like Roddy Bottom said, she'll be a different person in a couple months. The Courtney Love we have today with the designer dresses and the, you know, $20,000 earrings and sitting at uh, fashion shows in Paris, that's the real Courtney Love. A stuck up, pompous, arrogant debutante. It's so ironic that the woman we have chosen as a society to represent the grunge era, the queen of grunge, also represents everything the grunge era was against materialism, elitism, the hierarchy, and all you can do about it is laugh. So, exactly how does Cap Jellin find her escape? Well, Courtney does to the screenwriter of Sid and Nancy the same thing she did to Cap. She finds her phone number, she calls her up, and she charms her. A girl I'd never heard of before, never, didn't know, calls me on the phone at home, it tells me her name's Courtney Love, and that she was, she is destined to play Nancy Spungen. And she was so funny and so persistent in a way that was just charming that I'm finally like, okay, 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 you can come, you can come and read. She charms the lady and the lady agrees, yes, Courtney, you can come down to LA and read for the role of Nancy Spungen, a person that Courtney was obsessed with, completely obsessed with the Sid Vicious Nancy Spungen story. If you have to move while your roommate is gone, something is wrong. That is not a normal relationship. There is fear involved in this relationship. Relationship. There have been times throughout Cap Jellin's career interviews where I think something about Courtney is just on the tip of her tongue and then she clams up and I just think what was she going to say? I still feel like there's fear involved. Courtney comes back and Cat's gone. Cat moves on to Minnesota and she starts the band Babes in Toyland. Um, I moved to Minneapolis in 1986 and um, it took me about three months to meet Lori, the drummer. And I saw her at parties and dancing and she was very lively and, you know, she didn't know how to play an instrument at all. But I just liked her personality, you know. I'd been in three bands before on the West Coast, like the Vina Rays, Italian Hornons, and some other various bands. But Notice that Kat does not mention Sugar Baby Doll. She says, and other various bands. She doesn't even count it as a real band. Also, kudos to Cap Jellin for taking other women under her wing and teaching them how to play their instruments. Or at least taking the time to play guitar and let them practice and teach themselves. Cap Jellin began a lot of careers for a lot of women. And to me, Cap Jellin is the queen of grunge. I wanted to get a band that didn't know how to play. So yeah, 1986 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I met her at a barbecue at her house, and I said, hey, you wanna play drums? And she said, yeah. I love her attitude. I love it that she looks at it as a challenge. I don't even need people who can play music. I'm so good that I'll just teach you and I'll help you practice, and we will become an awesome band. It seems to me that the first thing Kat requires of a bandmate is friendship. I've always wondered if people like Kat, if people like Courtney or, or Kurt or, or Chris Cornell, Lane, I've, I, I often wonder, do they revolve their life around music 
because of the music or does it have something to do with camaraderie and, and friendship and family and, and bonds that can't be broken? I've been in several bands. I've been in a band where two members didn't like each other. It just doesn't work no matter how hard you try. And the only band I've ever been in that I really miss was with my best friends in high school. We were like brothers. I think that's how Kat runs her band. You have to be sisters. Not only the music, but the actual band itself is fulfilling a basic human need, the need to be accepted. Courtney obviously did something that turned Kat away from her and made her want to run, or more likely it was a number of things. Perhaps Courtney's manipulative, cruel side came out and Kat noticed. Now, would you think that Courtney would take a hint? My roommate took off and moved clear across the country while I was gone. Nope. Courtney follows Kat to Minnesota. See, I don't remember this, but I probably did say, why don't you come out to Minneapolis and play and see how it goes? And I enjoyed her company there, but she has this weird tendency to take over, you know? A bunch of alpha bitches in one room is not a fun thing. And this is where Courtney commits her second illegal con job, and this is what is left out of Courtney Love Behind the Music. Basically, Behind the Music talks about her next film, Straight From Hell, which was a huge failure, and then it just skips a couple years. Her latest reinvention, a spectacular failure, Courtney went into isolation. I was like, this, and I went to Alaska. I just stripped and shut up and simplified everything in my life. Essentially, the documentary is skipping 1987, the year that Courtney followed Cap Jelen out to Minnesota. Kat says that she doesn't remember inviting Courtney. She just kind of showed up. It was sort of an awkward reunion and Courtney just kind of bullied her way into Babes in Toyland. When she was trying out for Spin Nancy, I just kind of took off sneakily. I just didn't want to play with her anymore. It was too high drama. And so I just wanted to go play garage music and she wanted to be more pop. But Courtney didn't get the hint. When Kat formed a new band with drummer Lori Barbero, Courtney showed up too. Kat called the band Babes in Toyland. Things were great until the girls started to jam. Courtney came out, practiced once with us or twice on bass, which was probably not her instrument anyway. And then she stayed a little bit longer and a bunch of crap happened and she split back to LA, I guess. You see what I mean when I say you get the feeling Kat wants to say something, but then she clams up? A bunch of crap happened, and then she split back to L.A. Remember how Kat described herself sneakily leaving. She said, I split. So when Cap Jelen says someone split, it means they left a bad situation behind them in a hurry because you want to get the F out of Dodge before whatever you're leaving catches up to you. Luckily, Courtney's own biographer tells us a little more about 1987 and what Courtney did that year in Minnesota that made her not just split, but split all the way to Alaska. She was really quite good at hustling and getting people excited about things and promoting. So she got a whole bunch of bands, including the Butthole Surfers, to come and play this show. And it was at the Orpheum, this really beautiful theater, you know, like where plays are put on and stuff. Years and years of reading rock magazines and interviews with numerous bands has taught me one major thing. Even before Courtney Love married Kurt Cobain, even before you and I knew who Courtney Love was, Courtney Love was a part of that whole underground scene that ended up becoming mainstream. And wherever she went, she burnt bridges with people. A lot of people in the music community have despised her since before she was famous. One thing I learned from all these different interviews is that everyone has a Courtney Love story and 99% of the entire music community despises Courtney Love. It seems like all these musicians have a story. It's not like, oh, I just don't like her. It's like she did something to me or to someone I know. She caused a problem. And I always wondered why the butthole surfers despised her so. They respected her when Kurt was around because of Kurt, but it was obvious they did not like her. They did not trust her. Basically what happened was Courtney promoted this concert, got these guys to come, and although most documentaries will say the show bombed, 
It did not bomb. It was very successful. Wherever the butthole surfers went, they were very successful. Courtney, the promoter, pulled the old take the money and run. And she ran out of town. I remember Courtney leaving on the plane really fast. Unfortunately, back in the day, 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the early 90s, this kind of thing happened a lot. As Henry Rollins has mentioned in an interview with Nardwar. Did you hate Winnipeg as well? Yeah, yeah, because the promoter ripped us off. We actually had to go to his house to get his get to get paid and also some of our equipment got ripped off and at one point uh someone poured a beer into our soundboard she ended up back in la where she heard about a profitable dancing gig up in alaska and that is where most documentaries take off again they just sort of skip over minnesota and go right to alaska anybody who has ever stripped or dated a stripper uh as i have i didn't know she was a stripper until after we broke up i actually thought she was a, a waitress uh making really good tips that was a long time ago anyway stripping is profitable anywhere you go you don't have to go to alaska to do it Rumor is Courtney Love went to Alaska because she was actually afraid the cops might be looking for her and she thought Alaska was the last place anyone could find her. And she stayed there for a while until she found out no one was looking for her, no one had reported her to the police. But it was not uncommon for bands to go and track down promoters who'd rip them off and physically force them to pay. It was not an uncommon thing for promoters to rip bands off. It was not uncommon for bands to track down that promoter. I think pro probably because she was a woman, the butthole surfers and the rest of the bands were just like, lesson learned, never do a show for her ever again. On the other hand, according to Courtney Love's own biographer and her best friend Cap Jelen, she was on a plane very quickly, immediately after the show, almost as if she had already booked a flight. So they probably did look for her, and she was long gone. Bye-bye!